recognizing a member for Oak Bay Gordon Head. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and please let me be the first to congratulate the members from Surrey White Rock and Kamloops North Thompson for their maiden speeches in this new Parliament. Um, Honourable Speaker, I rise to speak to the, uh, uh, in response to the throne speech. Now, Honourable Speaker, in, 20, in the 2017 election, the BC Greens ran on a new vision for British Columbia that we will put at the very centre of all our decision-making in the months and years ahead. And there are three central tenets that underpin our vision that we explained and took to British Columbians in the 2017 election. First, we believe, the BC Greens believe, that it is the moral responsibility of government to promote the health and well-being of British Columbians. Everything else that government does should serve this purpose. Second, Honourable Speaker, we believe that equity should be a fundamental value of government and that government should operate in the best interests of not only the present generation, but also future generations to come. We too, Honourable Speaker, should leave a better world to the next generation, as our parents did to us. And frankly, Honourable Speaker, this looks like we were heading to be the first generation in British Columbia, the first generation in British Columbia where we would hand off to the next generation an environment and social systems and an economy that was not the same as we inherited from our parents. It was trending downwards. It is the future of our children and our grandchildren, not only our own well-being, that is at stake in the decisions that we make today in this legislature. The, th the third central tenet, honor Honourable Speaker, is that government should act as stewards of our public resources to ensure that ba they benefit all British Columbians, both today and into the future. Our natural resources cannot continue to be harvested in a Loraxian fashion for short-term gain and benefits of a privileged few. And for, I was asked by the member from Powell River Sunshine Coast to provide, to provide an explanation of Loraxian. Well, it, I, I ask people to go and read the Dr. Suits book called The Lorax. <laughs> the Lorax quite beautifully illustrated what happens, what happens when, you, when you think not as to the consequences of your decisions today, where you focus only on short term gain and the benefits of a few. You know, our core central tenets may seem obvious, but they've been fundamentally lacking in our province, in my view, in our view, far too long. We offered, the BC Greens offered a revision to restore these core values to government and to improve the lives of all British Columbians. Our vision, our vision included this. Our vision was a vision to seize the opportunities in the emerging economy by supporting dynamic business development in a changing economy to invest in early childhood education, not simply daycare, to give our children the strongest possible start, to invest in public education. Over $4 billion was found in our budget, our fully costed budget, to invest in public education and lifelong learning, to ensure people had the knowledge, skills, and abilities to be successful in the economies of today and tomorrow. We had a vision to tackle climate change head on while positioning BC at the forefront of economic opportunities in the transition to a low carbon economy. We had a vision to ensure that all British Columbians have their basic needs met by piloting basic income and increasing welfare rates so that they never fall so far down that they cannot get back up again. That those less fortunate than many here are not stuck in a poverty trap that they can never escape from. And our vision was to ensure that everyone has access to the means that support a healthy life. Our vision was based on the conviction that government should make decisions based on principles and evidence, not political calculation and political opportunism. Our vision was based on, a con on, on the conviction that government should put people's interests first, ahead of special interests and corporate or union donors. Our vision was based on the conviction that BC's ec economic economy comprises and should benefit every British Columbian, not just the wealthy few. 
Our vision was based on the conviction that prudent fiscal management is essential. We cannot burden future generations with poor planning and short-term decision-making today. Our vision was based on the conviction that planning and government decision-making should extend beyond the next election cycle and that we need to consider the long-term effects of our decisions and actions. As the BC Liberals have said many times, governing is about priorities. So in considering the throne speech, we should do so in the context of how it lives up to our priorities and the values that we as BC Greens ran on. We ran our election campaign on many of the policies that the BC Liberals have just embraced in the throne speech. Before this election, Honourable Speaker, I spent four years in the Legislature pushing for action on these issues, as did other MLAs, advocacy organizations, experts and concerned citizens, pushing for issues like removing the influence of big money from our politics, pushing for issues like addressing our unacceptable rates of poverty in this province through raising social assistance rates and implementing a poverty reduction strategy. We were pushing for our action on investing in childhood education to address the childhood uh, care crisis affecting families across British Columbia and to provide children with a strong basis for lifelong learning to enable them to succeed in the challenging economy of the 21st century. We were pushing for discussions on issues to take meaningful action on climate change to ensure that the world we leave for our children is no worse than the world our parents left for us. The BC Liberals' astonishing about face in this throne speech raises the question, after 16 years of operating on one set of values, how can British Columbians trust that they truly believe, that is the BC Liberals truly believe, in this new set of values? How many of the members opposite how many of the members opposite, Honourable Speaker, for the first time when they heard the throne speech said, we stand for this now? How many of the members knocked on the doorsteps in the last election campaigning for childcare, campaigning for increased education funding, campaigning for a poverty reduction plan, campaigning for basic income? I suspect none. Certainly not in my riding and certainly not in the many ridings in British Columbia that I, I went to on behalf of the BC Green candidates running there. You know, Honourable Speaker, I come back to this. How can we trust that this change, this change in principles and values, so fundamental, not just add a little of this, add a little of that, a fundamental and structural change in values, how can we tr believe, how can we trust that this change was based on principle and integrity, as opposed to pure, cynical, political calculation and the desire to continue to stay in power. You know, Honourable Speaker, British Columbians have been calling on this government for years to ban big money. I've forgotten how many times the, the uh, leader of the official opposition has brought in six, it is, brought in legislation. To that, we could add a couple of times that Bob Simpson and, and Vicky Huntington did as well. Each and every time. I would have done it too had that not been done so many times before. Each and every time. This fell on deaf ears. Even each and every time, nobody listened. The BC Liberal response was we're going to report out more, more often. We're going to rub the fact that we're accepting corporate and union donations, outrageous donations from companies that we have to make key strategic decisions on, on the behalf of British Columbians. And we're just going to tell you about it a little more often. Shocking, Honourable Speaker. British Columbians have been calling on banning big money for such a long time, yet the government has refused. Until today. Now the BC Liberals have committed to banning big money today, and yet continue to rake in the millions of corporate uh, from, from corporate donations. Witness, within three days of the election, the BC Liberals raised a million dollars from their corporate backers. Shame, Honourable Speaker. A government that is principled, a government that leads through conviction, is one that practices the behaviour they expect others to model. And I challenge the BC Liberals today 
to stop accepting corporate donations, as the BC Greens did in September of 2016. If they were truly committed to banning big money, they could follow our lead. The lead that we put to British Columbia in September of 2016, when the BC Green Party stopped accepting uh, union and corporate donations. Let's go to bridge tolls, Honourable Speaker. This one is remarkable. To this day, the BC Greens stand against removing the bridge tolls, but we recognize that as a budgetary measure, we would support the budget brought in by the new government, uh, minority NDP government. But let's come back to the cynicism and political calculation. During the election, the Minister of Finance told British Columbians this, and, and I quote, the decision to forego all toll revenues in the way the NDP announced, dot, 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 for Hansard, will guarantee a credit downgrade. This decision in and of itself is sufficient to lead to a credit downgrade. So now, Honourable Speaker, mere th six, seven weeks post this statement, we no longer have to worry about a credit downgrade. Is this about, is this about political conviction or is it about political calculation? That was April the 10th that that statement was made. Now we're talking about unexpected surpluses. And nobody's concerned about the credit rating anymore. Well, I am, Honourable Speaker. I'm an Honourable Speaker, and the BC Greens are, which is why we do not support removing tolls on the bridges that exist, and have not supported all along, in a consistent manner, Honourable Speaker, because it is, we believe it is good, good fiscal policy. What are the revenue implications of toll bridges? Are they, they're, they're not a one-year one budget consideration. It's not something that you can kind of change without long-term consequences. What justifies this change? We don't know. What about the sources of new money? 30 of the 48 throne speech initiatives outlined in the government news release were nowhere to be found in the Liberal election platform. Now, I recognize and I have respect for the fact that the throne speech was offered with humility. They recognized that British Columbians had sent a message, a message that the direction the province was changing had, was going had to change. But the, but the government now has said it can finally make these 30 of the 48 for throne speech initiatives that weren't there because it has suddenly found new money. Well, Honourable Speaker, I'm not sure where the new money was found because we haven't had the fiscal year update yet, and that's not going to be announced until either later this week or next year. Yet I wonder where this, I'm wondering where this money is coming from. Just two months ago, two months ago, the Minister of Finance cautioned against many of the provinces that the BC Greens and the BC NDP made. He said this, the suggestion that these promises can be accommodated within a balanced budget, absent massive tax in increases, is simply absurd. Who do we believe now? But now they can be. They, now they can be, Honourable Speaker. They now suddenly can be found in the budget. At the 11th hour, 11th hour of a government on its way out. They promised to implement many of those exact same premises that were too costly to do. Yet, they haven't been clear on where the money will come from. The generally accepted accounting practices used by the government dictate that any unspent surplus from a previous fiscal year is allocated to paying down the budget. Full stop. Has the government suddenly changed that policy, a policy that suddenly is, we haven't discussed? That's what the government's supposed to do, pay down the, the debt with any surplus that exists from the previous budget. We aren't even through the first quarter of the fiscal year, so I'd be surprised if the government had reliable updated financials from this year yet. So this statement, this statement that suddenly there's more money, frankly, is akin to promises that we've seen historically of 100,000 jobs, $1 trillion increase in GDP, $100 billion prosperity fund, debt-free BC, thriving schools and hospitals, the famous unicorns in everyone's backyard, yes. as a consequence of an LNG industry that doesn't exist. Elimination of GST, PST, and on and on. You know, and within the fiscal framework, 
of the budget they tabled in February of this year, there was no room for long-term planning to ensure that there is stable funding for these new promises. No room whatsoever. So how can British Columbians trust that this government has intention to follow through with these new promises when they are premised on a sur surprise surplus? Is this just more politicking with the provincial budget now that it has become politically expedient to invest the gov in government services? I ask these questions because they get to the heart of the question of trust. Is this truly a genuine principled about face or is this simply more of the same politics that British Columbians voted to change? The initiatives that were announced in this throne speech should not be treated as throwaways, as treats to buy votes in an election year, in an attempt to retain a grip on power, or as a surprise bonus when there's an unexpected surplus. These policies need to flow from a principled vision for British Columbia and a plan on how to get there, a principles and plans that the BC Greens offered in the last election campaign. And perhaps the government arrives at this astonishing change. Perhaps they did arise at, arrive at this genuinely. Who's, who knows? But either way, we cannot have confidence in a government that for 16 years has argued against precisely these same policies. And in the last few days, and in only the last few days, has suddenly recognized that, they are, that these policies put forward by the BC NDP for, say, 12 of the 16 years, and the BC NDP and the BC Greens for the last four years, are now suddenly in the best interest of British Columbians, without a clear demonstration that the change is driven by principles and not simply political expediency. Principles are demonstrated through action, Honourable Speaker, and we simply haven't seen the actions from this government to justify our confidence in it and to see the faces on the members opposite, Honourable Speaker, as the throne speech was read out, was truly a remarkable event. You know, I only had three words for the member from Chilliwack afterwards, after the throne speech was, this, and the, the, uh, was read, and it was these. Well, 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 I said to the member from Chilliwack, who clearly was aghast with his mouth near his, his chest as he listened to the words emanating from the, the, during the speech from the throne. My colleagues here remember one too many well, well, wells over the years. You know, with all of that said, we have an incredible opportunity here. And I do believe it's actually an exciting opportunity. Never before have we had such potential for each and every MLA in this legislature to represent their constituents before their party. That's exciting, Honourable Speaker. That's exciting because we have a chance to put people ahead of party politics, backroom politics, and I hope that we can do that. The Liberals, the BC Liberals, over the course of a 40-minute throne speech, did a 180. Actually, they did a 720. They did a 320 and a 320, and it, and it was like dizzy, dizzy <laughs> on sig a significant number of their policies and priorities. I think that's great. I think that's great that they now believe that they should be able to work when those policies, those similar policies are brought forward under an NDP minority government, they'll work towards ensuring that they're implemented in a manner that we can all support. And that is an exciting, exciting opportunity. You know, I can just imagine, you know, today at first reading, we didn't vote for because we have not tested the confidence of this legislature for two bills. The first bill was a rather expensive bill for the BC Greens to not uh, uh, vote forward to grant us party status, but it was the principal thing to do, Honourable Speaker. But the sec more importantly, the second bill on banning big money, have had a chance to look at it briefly because we were just given a copy, has elements that I think would be wonderful amendments to a bill or some of the bills that have been brought in historically by the BC NDP. There's ground for a stable government moving forward where we actually take the best ideas from both sides of this House. Unfortunately, Honourable Speaker, 
The BC Liberals have had 16 years of not listening to any of the amendments or ideas being put forward in the, in the committee stage from bills, and now we have an opportunity to actually make that work. And that is very exciting, Honourable Speaker. The BC Greens will work with every member of this House in good faith in the pursuit of good public policy. That is our goal. That is what we'll focus on. The opportunity, as I said, that we have to improve the health and well-being of British Columbians is now bigger than ever, and we must proceed with respect for the electorate. I emphasize, we must proceed with respect for the electorate to make this government work, not play cynical political tricks in the desperate attempt, the desperate quest to retain power. This is not about power. This is about respect for the electorate. The results that British Columbians delivered in the May election require cooperation, the throne speech read. Your government is committed to working with all parties in the legislature, the throne speech said, as are we. British Columbians, the throne speech said, want a stable government, and in sending us this result, they expect us to listen and find, find a way to work together. They expect us to collaborate while respecting the dignity, rules and traditions that govern our constitutional monarchy, our democracy and this legislature. I could not have said it better. That is precisely what British Columbians want, which is precisely we need, why we need to get on with the business of governing this province, dealing with the issues that need to be dealt with and move towards having a confidence vote in the present government as soon as possible. You know, Honourable Speaker, the throne speech, all, honourable different speaker, the throne speech um, also said, with that in mind, instead of focusing on areas of disagreement, we should reflect on who it is that we are and what we share in common. Again, honourable speaker, I agree entirely, and I'm ex excited and thrilled by the prospects of actually having everyone in this house work towards good public policy in the province of British Columbia, one that reflects the diversity of views, one that's not artificially constrained between this, this dichotomy that has been artificially created between rural and urban areas. You know, Honourable Speaker, it's offensive to British Columbians to continue to hear this urban versus rural divide. It is only a divide because the BC Liberals have made it a divide. It is when you when you say year after year after year to rural British Columbians that they are somehow different from urban British Columbians, you create a divide. That's irresponsible governance. It's not putting the interests of British Columbians at first. There's nothing different between a person living in Kelowna, Fort St. John, Prince Rupert, Victoria, Cranbrook. They're all British Columbians and they all want the same thing, a quality education, quality health care, strong and vibrant economy and to protect our environment. The fact that this government has for 16 years been driving a wedge between rural and urban folk, frankly, is all the more reason why they need to be put in a timeout so that we can re-establish the trust between the rural and, and, and urban British Columbia. We're starting this term with an, unpre with an unprecedented, on record, level of agreement to cooperate and collaborate to resolve the most difficult challenges facing our province. A stable foundation from which to govern. We have all party agreement on, on some of our core philosophies and key issues that were outlined in the throne speech. And if the BC Liberals are serious about these promises, if this is more than a political gambit, <coughs> then this House can pass more legislation than ever before on the issues that matter to people. Not vested union or corporate interests, but people in British Columbia. Issues like political and democratic reform, lobbying reform, child care and early childhood education, solutions to the housing crisis. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we actually debated solutions to the housing crisis? I don't know how many times. <coughs> I don't know how many times the member from Vancouver Point Grey brought forward solutions to the housing crisis that simply fell on deaf ears, simply fell on deaf ears as it continued to get away from us. When we get big money out of politics in BC, the interests of people will return to the forefront, and we can restore people's faith in government and show them that government is working for people because ultimately there's a lack of, there's a lack of trust in British Columbia that needs to be regained. <clears throat> we can, and already are, 
fundamentally changing how politics works in BC. This is an incredible opportunity, Honourable Speaker. I will not be supporting the throne speech. I will be voting against the throne speech. But more importantly, I encourage members on both sides to move towards a confidence motion in this legislature today so that we can actually get on with the business of government.